What's the difference between paying a fee and paying a fine? The answer to this question may not be as small or insignificant as we're inclined to believe. I recently picked up the book, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It lays out some uh, valuable concepts and ideas about investing and managing our finances, growing our wealth. But there's one idea that I wanted to share because, yeah, from an investing standpoint, it's important, critical even, but it's relevant to so much more. And I think an understanding of it will help us in many aspects of life. So first, let's start with the financial piece and then we'll sort of grow the metaphor, right? Because Housel talks about how we should look at investing in the market. And one of the hardest things for us to deal with is the market's volatility. Right? It's difficult for us to invest our hard-earned money and then see the market go, let's say, for example, down 20%. Like seeing that huge dip in our investment, that's not fun. Right? Everyone knows that. That can be nerve-wracking. And it dissuades a lot of people from investing or keeping their money in when they should. It ultimately uh, keeps them from getting the returns available to them. Right? But here's the point he makes. He says, those people who see that volatility as a fee and not a fine are more inclined to win in the long term. Understanding that market returns are never free, they demand a price. And that price is the roller coaster ride that we all have to deal with. That is the market. It's the ups and downs and highs and lows. That volatility is the cost of admission. And if you understand that, you're more inclined to stay calm. Keep your long-term vision. You're more than likely to come out on top. On the other hand, if when that turbulence arrives, you know, the sudden crashes, the ups and downs, and you see it as a fine, as this terrible thing that's happening to a punishment, you're more likely to act emotionally, to be reactive and make decisions that aren't in your best interest. To drive the point home, he mentions Disneyland, for example. The fee is $100. And people will gladly pay that fee because, you know, they get that uh, great experience with their family, their kids that they'll have for the rest of their lives. That $100 isn't a fine. It's not a punishment. It's an intentional, deliberate trade of one thing for another. And if you were to look at it as a fine, you'd never get to enjoy that experience. If you thought that $100 was a punishment, uh, it just wouldn't be the same, right? And so why do I bring all this up? Because I'm a firm believer that the best things in life all come with that price or a fee, as Housel states. But I also think we sometimes have a tendency to look at that cost, that very same cost of admission, as a fine, as a problem when really, no, it's just trading some turbulence now for a reward a little bit uh, down the road. Sometimes the right thing is the hard thing, the uncomfortable thing. With dividends, it will pay so long as we understand that it's opening the door to something greater. Leaving a situation you know is not good for you hurts, right? We've all been there, we all know this in some capacity. But it's not a punishment or even a bad thing, right? That discomfort associated with walking away is a fee that will enable you to live a more aligned life in the very near future. Or let's say you're building something meaningful, something you care deeply about, but it's just you, you and the idea. There is no validation, certainly no external reward, not yet. And continuing forward in those moments is hard. It's taxing emotionally draining even. But this feeling, again, isn't a punishment. It's not a fine, it's the fee. It's the cost of admission to bring something into life that wasn't there. Life's greatest moments are expensive. It's just, are you going to pay the fee to bring it about or the cost of regret at a different time? And you get the point, right? You can take this and apply it to so many things. Falling down, criticism, feeling lost, having to start from the bottom. 
These things are not fines, they are fees. They are price tags. And so often, the initial price is a bargain compared to what we'll get back. We just need to stop perceiving their mere existence as the world working against us. No, these are opportunities in disguise. It's easy to walk by the important things, to dismiss the uncomfortable things. The harsh truth is that our greatest opportunities are often intertwined in our distress. That's why so many people walk away from the things that will make their lives better. That's why so many people pull their money from the market uh, when it takes a dive. So many people walk away from a project or idea when things get challenging. Or conversely, it's why so many people do nothing at all. They stay in situations they aren't happy with and know they need to change because the fee to get from point A to point B feels too steep. But I think the value is in comparing the discomfort, the cost, the fee to what it's going to bring you down the road because often it's a bargain. We need to remember that what it will ultimately provide has life-changing potential. Understand that resistance is not a fine. It is not the world telling you no. It's life asking you, hey, do you really want this? Because if you do, it's yours. So long as you sign the dotted line and pay the price, most people will be dissuaded by this. Most people will turn and walk away, but most people also leave a hell of a lot on the table. And I don't want that for you. You don't want that for you. The world we live in is one of abundance. So when life pushes back, understand that it's merely positioning you to move beyond your limits, to redefine your worldview. And while admission isn't free, it's well worth the price. There's a saying that will always be true. It will be true on your best days and your worst. It will be true after victory and it will be true after defeat. It will be true when you have momentum and it will be true when you're down on your luck doing everything in your power to create momentum. That saying is, your future begins now. Hey, on the surface, might not seem like much. Sure, my future starts now. I know that. Everyone knows that. Well, if that's true, if everyone does, in fact, know that, why do we spend so much time stuck, reliving our past, unable to break free? Why do we remain terrified to change? Why do we feel such a connection to who we were, how others saw us? Why must we remain loyal to the character we've been playing in our mental autobiographies? See, here's the thing about the past and the future. One is fixed, can't be changed, and the other, well, it's waiting for you to tell it what it is. One is expired time, one is planned to be determined. And it's interesting how we continue to conflate the two. Epictetus has said that the more things we value outside of our control, the less control we have. Well, I'm going to be the messenger here, relaying the precious truth that yesterday is in fact out of our control. What can be controlled is where we go from here, the next step. Meaning today is not your failures, it's where you take those lessons. It's not your mistakes, but it's what the stronger you can now endure because of them. It's not the dreams you let slip away, but where your pursuit might take you now. And yeah, yesterday certainly contributes to your outlook, as all information does. Its value considered, its impact assessed. It guides you, but it's not you. And that difference is astronomical. 
There's a question about the role the past plays in our lives. That has to mean something, right? Your past is, in many ways, your story. It's why you think the way you do. It's contributed to your understanding of the world. It will always be a part of you, and I believe that. But I also believe the past is a story. And just like reading one chapter in a book simply sets the stage for the next one without controlling its direction, so does every day that has led you up to now. Life gives us the tools to experience, to grow, learn, and then shed that which does not coincide with what's important. Your failures are not you. But they are precious in that they push you towards what you'd like to be. See, you can experience something and not be that thing. As Kierkegaard says, if you label me, you negate me. If you proclaim me to be X, you're essentially stealing from me the infinite possibility that is the future. Yesterday has nothing to do with what I can become. And so taking it a step further, never mind being labeled by someone else, how could you label yourself and see it as anything but self-sabotage? See, you're never defined by your past, but always learning from it. It's not who you are, it's the cheat codes for what you can be. Without that winding road of misfortune and mistakes, the incredible expansion we long for doesn't materialize. Imagine if everyone who, who ever felt down in life felt like a loser who temporarily lost hope. Imagine if they looked in the mirror and said, okay, this is who I am now. There would be no triumph in the world. Because anything meaningful requires the resiliency to map our way from the hell that was our darkest moments to what will become our proudest moments. Destiny. Destiny, destiny means that you separate the finite from the infinite. What you used to call yourself has prepared you to move towards the horizon. But what you used to call yourself is also as irrelevant now as those seconds that you watch tick away. Seconds that maybe you're not proud of. Seconds that perhaps taught you about the world. Seconds that gave you a glimpse of what's possible, unveiled the happiest of times, all of it. In its own unique way, it brought value, but none of it is your future. Why? Because back to that beautiful, all-powerful sentence, your future begins now. Your destiny is awaiting its marching orders, and all you have to decide as you stand today is where that ship will sail. Hello, 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 and welcome to day two. Thank you, Shane, for an amazing movie. And what a way to finish off. Where is your ship going to sail? That's what we're going to be looking at today. What type of assets do you want to invest in? What are the risks? What are the returns? Got some amazing uh, guests that I want to share with you because one of the things that I believe so much, and if you remember what we spoke about yesterday, it's all about partnership. So how do you find the right partners? And, and, and let's learn from them in terms of that process. So... Let's get started with day two. Now, we had a bunch of feedback yesterday in terms of from different people. And they said, oh, but Scott, you know, you, 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 you went too long. And I'm like, I know, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> I'm trying to give you 28 years worth of knowledge in like one hour. It's tough. Okay, so today we've got a lot to cover. And I'm going to get right into it. Um, and also what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you the high level stuff so that you understand. Call it the 30,000 view. And then I'm going to show you how you can go deeper because it's impossible for me to go deeper every day into all the stuff, but there are ways to do it. We've got ways to, to help solve it for you. So good morning to everyone for, uh, for joining. Wonderful to see you all here. 
And um, yeah, I hope you're excited in terms of as I am. I uh, really enjoyed yesterday and I look forward to taking it to the next level today. So day two, what is it all about? Types of investments, asset classes, and risk. Different types of investment and balancing risk and return goals. Just a couple of tips for success that I think are relevant. You know, try to pay full attention. No emails, WhatsApps, Facebooks, take notes. Try and teach someone else. Use the community. If you think of something that's valuable, put it out there and let others know. Play full on. Do the exercises. Commit to action for five days. You know, commit to yourself. Be on time. Think about what you commit to before you commit and do what we say. And then, you know, set, we're going to be setting goals, et cetera. Take action and have fun. So just some sort of age-old principles around, uh, you know, how to get success and most importantly, how to get the most out of your time that you're committing to this challenge. Now, I've got some good news for you. My business partner, Shane, has put together a resource guide. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of stuff with you today. And what I think is important is that we've got a resource guide for you. Now, we don't want to overwhelm you because there's different resources that will come through every day. So you need to just keep this link, the resource guide, and if we can just chuck it in the chat box for people or go and go and click it. It's a it's a working live document. So when we come up with something new, we put it in there and you'll have access to the resources. But what's great is that, you know, you don't have to remember it. One of the things I hate when I go on webinars or masterclasses or whatever is that, you know, I'm trying to like see where all the links are and everything else. And the good news is you've got your resource guide and you're just going to have all your links uh, down below in terms of that process. The next thing, just to remind you, it's really important if you're really wanting to get maximum engagement and value out of this to join the Facebook group. You know, this is where we are dropping all the different links, et cetera, and different resources. And, you know, over time, we will also build up the community and be able to share, you know, new information there. And then obviously the WhatsApp group. You know, I certainly use WhatsApp more than anything else. And it's a good way, an easy way to communicate. I know Shane and I certainly, that's the way that we give people updates, et cetera. So if you don't have these things, literally go and uh, and join the group. Um, don't worry, you're not going to be spammed. There's nothing like that. It's about getting results and being able to communicate with you. So let's remind you of where we finished off yesterday. There's a formula and it's about creating globally diversified passive income. Globally diversified passive income. It sits right at the center. And to achieve that, you need to diversify across five things. Countries, currencies, assets, partners, and time. So what we do at a mastermind level is we get very clear on the long-term goals and we then break them down into sub goals and then finally into tasks and activities. And then you need to monitor your progress all the way through. So this is not a goal setting course, but I just wanted to show you that if the long-term goal is to create globally diversified passive income, and if the milestones are countries, currencies, assets, partners, and time, you know, then you've got to then break that down into tasks and activities to actually go out there and to be able to get the results. So let's start with the tasks that we said yesterday. I asked you to go out and identify and list the risks associated with not diversifying. Now, did you do it? I know many of you will probably be like me when I was at school or university. It's like, ah, <laughs> I was doing it late last night or whatever. But my real strong recommendation is, is really make sure that you try and do the silver steps. Write down what's stopping you from diversifying. You know, I've heard it all. I've, I've literally done this presentation in 178 countries. And, you know, at the end of the day, most human needs are the same. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the knowledge. It sounds too good to be true. The scams. You know, how do I protect it? Which is a South African saying. I'm not very good at, at uh, pronouncing it. But whatever the different excuses are, you know, all over the world. Um, right now, the world's very risky. I don't want to do anything. I want to put my money under my pillow, whatever it is. Secondly, did you fill in your investor strategy sheet? You know, so again, your five whys. So important. The power of clarity. Why are you doing it? Take Michael and he said yesterday, one of the things that drove him through good times and bad times was that he was very, very clear on his why and then it helped him achieve his why. And then finally, did you share one of your key takeaways? So do me a favor. I'm interested in what your key takeaways were. Repetition is the mother of skill. If you're prepared to do it, just chuck it in the chat box. What were one of your key takeaways from yesterday? What is something that just stood out for you? One thing that you learned that would be valuable for you 
you know, even if you never turned up for day two, three, four, and five. But one key takeaway from yesterday, um, I'd love to see, you know, what some of the key takeaways were. And by the way, by sharing it, we all learn, you know, because I'm always fascinated. What did, what did people learn? What was their values? You know, what, what did they take out of it? What were one of their key takeaways, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I can see Andreas is focusing on the core strengths and branch out from there. Um, Andrea, sorry. Um, Taffy, right information, right partners. Maria, follow the formula of those who've done it, where you want to go while you, where, and where you are. Uh, 15 key assets and possibly thousands. Uh, key takeaways, the value of partnership, diversification, possibility, copying others who have done it and partner with them, diversification, copy model and master, fractional investing, assist diversification. Uh, procrastination is the biggest enemy. Start now. That one I will completely agree with. Um, so there's some brilliant ones here. Success leaves clues. Uh, why didn't I start earlier? Uh, five diversification, countries, currencies, time, etc. Brilliant. Well, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate that. It always helps me to see what some of the key takeaways were. Uh, no need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to diversification. It uh, must diversify to have freedom. Uh, learn from others who have done it before. So yeah, you know, again, just to remind everyone, it seems to be that one of the key takeaways was my massive breakthrough back in 2010, 2012 with uh, Tony Robbins. And um, again, just to remind you that you've kind of got these two things. You've got the the dabbler and the stressor. The dabbler just goes out and keeps trying to do different things. And then you've got the stressor who just kind of tries to do it all on their own. And it's a huge amount of stress and hassle and complexity and difficulty and da, da, da. And then you've got the master. And the master goes out and they follow people. They, they, they model people. They, met, they partner with people. And the easiest way to get from A to B is by working with people that have already done it before and partner. So it's nice to see that a lot of people are taking that as one of the key takeaways because it certainly was my massive breakthrough. You know, again, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that went out and tried to do it all on their own, get all the degrees, read all the books, do all the courses, um, you know, invest in property, mainly resident, well, only residential, all on my own. And then finally, it was like, when I had that epiphany moment of partnership, it just allowed me to go to the next level in terms of that process. So hopefully that's uh, really been reinforced uh, for a lot of people. Okay, just in terms of the gold, so the expectation was that you didn't do the gold last night, you don't have to, but ultimately I would recommend you come back. Uh, we will be you know, providing these slides and you come back and, and um, you, know, you literally look at what you have and you identify the risk. Just to remind you for today that uh, I'm not providing you with financial advice. I am providing you with my experience, my opinions, my mistakes, so that you can learn from the mistakes I've made and um, in fact, I just came off a call in Australia with a development there where we've got a big hole in the ground and it's really been a, a nightmare. And so, you know, if you've been investing for 28 years, I guarantee you not every deal worked. And if anyone tells you it worked, they're either lying, cheating or stealing. Like they're telling, if, if they tell you that they've never made a mistake and they've never lost money in any investment, they are literally lying, cheating or stealing, in my opinion, because I've never learned in my life something that's bulletproof. So the whole purpose of this is for you to go in with your eyes open, to learn the knowledge, to, to empower yourself, to get access to the information, to get access to partners, and to be able to take um, control for yourself. So let's go back to this formula. And we're going to start today with countries and currencies. And I'm going to share with you, you know, where you can go and get um, all the different resources and the links in terms of this process. Now, you know, when I did this, um, this in Wealth Going Global, we actually broke this up into multiple modules. And so you're just going to have to bear with me here because I'm literally going to have to run through this quite quickly. I've got a, um, an amazing guest who's coming at uh, in 30 minutes, <clears throat> a gentleman by the name of Gary Sachs. And Gary Sachs is one of the top developers in England. And he's going to be sharing with us what's happening in the London market. Where are the opportunities? How do you not invest like a mom and pop? Most people invest like mom and pop investors, middle class investors. How do you invest like the institutions? And so I need to I need to go through this content fairly quickly, but I will be sharing the links and I'll also be sharing with you ways you can go a lot deeper should you want to go and do it. So here's the first thing if you're wanting to look at residential property. Now, by the way, you've got residential property, you've got commercial property, and you've got other alternative assets. But if you're wanting to look at residential property, Here's a good graph from the IMF in terms of 
where the world is going and you know what is happening in the property market. Then if you're wanting to go to, to um, research, I believe the best research in the world is from The Economist. They go out and they literally look at 20 of the top markets in the world. And um, they've got all the graphs here. And I was showing the VIPs yesterday because there was someone living in Canada and they were saying, is the market overpriced, et cetera? And the beauty with this, with this graph is that you can literally go United States versus Canada and you can actually look at the results. So, um, you know, you can see where prices are overvalued, et cetera, in comparison. But what's really important is you've got real prices, you've got nominal prices, you've got income, and you've got rent. Okay, so what this basically means is real prices are obviously the actual price of the house. Nominal prices take into account inflation. Income is where it's price versus income. So if you look here, Canada is the most expensive, second most expensive market in the world. And the most expensive is New Zealand. So it's the most expensive property in the world is New Zealand based on affordability. And if you look, and just as interest in comparison with the United States, so, you know, United States is only 6% overvalued, whereas Canada is 44% overvalued. But the most important thing that you should always look at when you're comparing prices is, is income. Because whether you're buying a house to live in it or not, any asset that you own should be priced based on the amount of income that that asset can earn. So how much money is it going to put in your pocket every month? And so again, if you were just comparing, and I'm just using what I showed the VIPs yesterday. If you take Canada, you know, it's one of the most expensive markets, 78% overvalued, and the United States is 15% overvalued in, in residential at the moment. Now let's just compare that to, say, Britain. Um, and you can see that Britain is, you know, not nearly as bad as Canada, but still worse than America. Uh, what about Australia? So Australia, 47 cent overvalued. So can you start to see how powerful it is when you actually know, like, where to go and get the information? And by the way, you've got Australia, Austria, Belgium, Colombia, Denmark, Finnmark, France, Germany, Greece, Ireland, Netherlands, New Zealand, like South Africa. Let's look at South Africa. <clears throat> so, um, you know, South Africa is 3% overvalued based on rent uh, compared to America. And if you take it based on income, it's about the same as America. So it's just very interesting because now you've got the data. And how often do you sit with an estate agent or a financial planner or a friend and they sit there with all this information and they're like, oh, I know this and I know that. And I just go, I'm sorry, but let's go back to the data. Let's go back to the fundamentals. So let's keep going here because we could spend you know an hour on all of this. If you're wanting to go in and look at the global house price index, you can literally go and look at all the different um, markets. So now you want to compare New York versus London versus Sydney, exactly the same thing. Real prices, nominal prices and income. If you're wanting to go and look at um, American house prices, um, if you, I don't know if you do or don't know, but there's 300 uh, MSAs in America. I don't know why, but this thing's logged me out. Otherwise, logged me back in. Um, so you can go look at all the different um, areas of America and you can even do the same for um, the UK in terms of the British the British market. If you're wanting to look at the top research for, for England, um, the place I recommend is Academic Metrics. And, um, you know, this is, uh, there's seven different indices in England. Uh, most of them are run by the, by the mortgage companies and they kind of have their own, you know, reason to put out data. Uh, Academic Metrics comes straight off the deeds office. So I believe it's the most uh, valuable um, research out there. And every single month they bring out reports and you can literally go and read all about the, the UK market, what is happening, the research, et cetera. Um, and you can literally see what is, you know, what is happening in, in, the, in the UK market. If you want to keep going, you can go to CoreLogic. So this is for Australia. And uh, same thing, this is the best research that you can get for Australia. So you go and look and you can literally get all the news and research you can go and find out what's happening in the different city centers, et cetera. Um, then if you want to go to America, you've got SP Global. Um, so it's the SP Core Logic. And this is the best place to find all the information with regards to, to America. Reminding you that, you know, there's plenty of information out on the internet, but where do you get the right information? Where do you get the data you can actually trust? Uh, and the data we use to build our models out, basically. Um, if you go to South Africa, 
Um, interesting enough, when I wrote my book 10 years ago, um, I actually had the, uh, the ABSA housing index, which used to be the number one index, but it's now FNB in terms of commentary and reports and everything else. Um, so that's that's it. And, um, and so what's interesting is that if I go back to here and we look at countries, there are different levels that you can go to in terms of the countries. You know, you can look at um, first world countries, you can emerging world countries, but from the data that's out there, and I'm going to share with you some models as to how you can actually go about this. But if you were to go to, to this and you would look at, at, at countries, okay, when we created Wealth Going Global, we literally said, because we could give you that resources, and um, there's the link. Where's the link for the resources? Can you just chuck it in the chat box, Shane, so I can just click on it? Um, if you go to the link, there's a plethora of information. And what people need, they don't need more information. They need direction. So what we did with Wealth Going Global, which was the digital upgrade of the book, Property Going Global. So I wrote the book, Property Going Global. Um, I literally analyzed 16 different countries. I shared with you where to get all the information so that you could literally go out and, and do all this yourself. And, um, and what we realized, you know, I wrote the book as an evergreen book. But what we realized, you know, over 10 years is that firstly, um, in 2014, I started investing in commercial property. Um, by the way, this book was actually endorsed by Clem Sunton. I'm going to explain why. But I started investing in commercial property. Technology started having a big impact. And Shane, my partner, and I decided it was time to do a digital upgrade. And so if you want to do it all on your own, we'll literally give you a copy of Property Going Global. Just, just type in their book, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of the book. Okay. Um, if you want to go to the resources, and if you want to do it all yourself, you can literally go here. Here they all are. I saw someone in the chat box saying, where, where do I get the links? And, you know, literally all the different links, global, America, South Africa, UK, Australia, will all be here. You can literally see. There they all are. So if you want to go and do all the work yourself, you can. You know, I remind you, sorry, I'm not going to keep going back to it. But if you want to go be a stressor and do it all yourself, you can. Here's all the links. You can literally go and do it all yourself. If you want to do it in partnership, well, we literally created this, um, this this home study course, Wealth Going Global. And module number one is countries. And just by the way, the VIP people actually get this uh, for free as part of their VIP package, um, the first module just um, on the countries. So uncovering the global market, where to invest. What is the mission here? We'll help investors get 100% clarity on the countries they wish to invest in and avoid the mistakes that more than 80% of investors make. Now, what you need to do is, and why Clem Center came into it, is Clem Sunter is one of the top scenario planners in the world. I told you yesterday, he's worked with the Chinese government. Um, he's worked with the South African government through the democratic change. He used to be chairman of Anglo Gold. He's worked with Harvard University and is one of the respect, most respected scenario planners in the world. And he's got a whole way of looking at the world and taking global scenarios and probabilities. So right now, there's um, 10 different flags that you need to look at in the world global economy. There's two different scenarios. And, and then there's a bunch of probabilities based on those flags and those scenarios. And again, for me, in chapter three and four of this book, um, Clem Santa actually wrote uh, chapter three and four of this book and explained how that all works. The challenge is you've got to keep updating it. So, you know, you can go and read his book, Thinking, Thinking the Future. You can go and, you know, print out all his, all his documents. I mean, there's loads and loads of information that's out there. Um, or you can just come on Wealth Going Global, where um, we literally interviewed him um, in the last couple of months and said, right, what are the latest scenarios? What are the latest flags? What are the latest probabilities? And what you do is you take all those probabilities and then you stick them into our four-dimensional model. And this four-dimensional model takes into account all the fundamentals. So it takes into account economic risk, it takes into account the value of the property, it takes into account population growth, it takes into account supply and demand, rule of law. And what that ultimately does is there's a matrix and ultimately it gives you a risk index. Then on the other side, you've got return. So you've got your, your yield or your income, which we give a 70% weighting. And then you've got your capital growth, which has a 30% weighting. So you've got your risk return and you've got your, sorry, you've got your risk index and you've got your, your return index. And again, Clem Santa actually helped me build this out. So you can see at the bottom here, you've got your risk. So you've got low risk to high risk, and then you've got low return to high return. And my whole philosophy in life is don't just guess. You know, is London a good place to invest right now or not? Don't have an opinion or a gut feel. Look at the fundamentals and look at the research. So 
This is the graph um, specifically actually from uh, 10 years ago. Um, when I did Wild Going Global, I actually updated this uh, with the latest information in terms of, you know, I've now shown you where to get the research. You can go and do it all yourself if you want to, or you can literally, you know, come and come and learn uh, from us in terms of all the different, um, you know, the latest research in terms of where you're looking at. But you can see from here, the best place to be is in this yellow box, which is high return, low risk. Now, 10 years ago, America was a no-brainer. You were buying property at a 50% below, below replacement cost. They were very good um, uh, income, you know, yields. And, you know, the currencies were weak against the dollar, so it made sense. Uh, or sorry, strong against the dollar, so it made sense. What's happened in 10 years, prices have gone up dramatically. You know, other currencies around the world have halved. And, you know, if you invest in America 10 years ago, like Michael did, you'd be celebrating all the way to the races. If you haven't, you know, is it still the right place to invest or not? And that's why, you know, what I'm sharing with you is all the research. And ultimately, with this investor strategy sheet, you can now go away and you can say, okay, well, what are the top five countries? Where do I want to invest? You know, what do, what do I need to, you know, what do I need to know in terms of investing? We use a system called GITS, which is our global investment due diligence system. And it starts at the top and it goes, you know, what, what are the macroeconomics of the country? You know, what do I need to know? What's happening with currency and, and the impact of big currencies around the world? How do I structure a deal? How do I find the right partners? What cities should I invest in? What you know, type of deal should I invest in? There's 10 different levels that you go all the way through in terms of this, this whole process. And we call it GIDS, the Global Investment um, Due Diligence System. So I've just given you a tip of the iceberg um, to show you how to do this. Again, you can do it on your own or you know, I'll share with you um, ways that you know, we can do it together in terms of that process. But the simple terms, you know, if you go back to, to the resources, you know, you need to go out now and you can do all the research yourself and you can say, right, what are the top five countries that I want to invest in, in terms of the process? And if you come back to the formula, you know, remember the number one thing is to choose your top five countries. The next thing on the formula is currencies. And so, you know, you've got the currency conundrum, managing risk in a global investment. You know, do I put it in the dollar? Is the dollar going to fall apart? Are they going to lose the reserve currency? What about the pound? What impacts Brexit having? What about the euro? They've got an inflation crisis in, in Europe. Oh, okay, I don't know. What about maybe putting it in India? Or is the RAND going to keep devaluing? And people have analysis paralysis and they go round and round and round in circles. So where do you actually do it? So the whole idea here with, with module two was around currencies. will help investors diversify their portfolio and mitigate their risk by investing in multiple currencies. And so, you know, when I, when I wrote the book, we actually came up with a concept called the Global Wealth Index. Now, it's just like a typical basket of goods that manages inflation, but ultimately it, it, it calculates your, your purchasing power. And so we went out and we said, right, what is our purchasing power? Now you can do this in any currency. You can do this in rand to dollar, uh, dollar to euro, whatever it is. And you can compare a basket of goods in terms of your purchasing power. And if you take, as an example, in South Africa, over the last 40 years, you've lost 92% of your purchasing power. 92%. It's quite scary. The RAND has lost on average 6% a year against the US dollar for the last 40 years. Now, it's not just about South Africa. You could be in Singapore and trying to decide if you should invest in America or in America and trying to decide if you should invest in Germany. And this provides you with the ability to be able to make those decisions. Again, you can do it on your own. What I would highly recommend is working with a partner of mine, James Painter. Now, James actually wrote chapter two of this book, Property Going Global. And I've been working with James. I don't actually even know now. It's well more than a decade because he wrote the book a decade ago. So it's probably 15 years or so. And what James does is he looks at pattern recognition. So I, I'm not going to go into how he does it. He uses the Elliott Wave method and, and you know some fancy statistics. But at the end of the day, it's pattern recognition. They look at patterns. They look at human emotion and what's happening. And I've worked with him now, as I said, for 15 years. And I've always been blown away by how much accuracy he had in terms of where the different currencies were going. Um, now he goes into the different assets and commodities and everything in between. And actually, as in terms of module two, within Wealth Going Global, he actually shared the three main secrets, you know, the hidden engine behind the markets, you know, why exchange rates go up and down. And he's given a gift to, to all of you. So um, he very kindly, 
he's got a he's got a website here. Uh, where's it gone now? Here we are. Uh, called Forex Forecast. And, you know, again, this uh, you can go into here and you can literally see they've got short, medium, and long-term um, outcomes in terms of different currencies. So I'm just going to show you the rand to dollar um, just to give you an example. But, you know, most people would sit here and go like, I've got no idea what these charts are saying. I don't know whether they're going up or down. But if you, you know, if you learn to, to look at the charts, you can look at this on a short-term basis. This is a, a near-term basis. This is a medium-term basis. And this is a long-term basis. And um, the nice thing is you can go and actually look at the different reports. You can see what's happening with the different currencies. You can see the probabilities here in terms of where the, you know, where the different currencies are going to go over time. And literally module two, he has taught people how to choose their top five currencies, not based on opinion, not based on gut feel, but based on the fundamentals of the market and where they're going. So I wanted to offer you guys a gift. And James has really kindly offered everyone a gift. We're going to put in the resource guide a 14-day um, trial to the Forex forecast for free and a seven-day trial uh, to the other forecasts, which are all the other currencies uh, for free. Um, so you're literally going to get that in the resource guide. Um, James has given a, a, a coupon code um, so that you can go and access that um, for the seven days free. And you can go take a look around. Um, you know, we, we said that we were going to arrive today and, and really help you um, get the right information. You're going to get to choose whether you want to do it on your own or whether you want to do it with us and with our partners. But that's your choice, really. And um, yeah, I can see some people have said thank you. Only two people. <laughs> so I phoned James on the weekend. I was like, dude, I can't teach them how to do all of this stuff without actually sharing away um, for them to, to read it and see it. So you can see I'm, a, I'm you know, subscribed to it live. And what I do is I take all this information and then I put it into, into models to help us make the right decisions. So hopefully now you can actually see that if we go back to the formula here, okay, of countries, currencies, assets, and partners. Now, what am I doing? I need to go back to my PowerPoint. I've just shown you <clears throat> in 20 odd minutes at a residential level where to get the information from current you know, countries. Um, in, in the wealth going global, we go deeper. We've got much more time. We go deeper into commercial assets and where to get the research for commercial alternative assets and where to get the research for that. Um, and then currencies. But can you see how we've literally boom, boom, covered countries and currencies to help you make the right decisions in terms of where you're at? So now what I want to do, and really it's the focus of today, is to focus on assets and which assets do you focus on in building your global portfolio? and selecting the right asset for an investment. Now, the mission here is to help investors choose the top 15 assets um, that would help them invest without losing money and spending decades researching through trial and error, <laughs> by the way, like I did. And I'm sure many, many others have done the same in terms of that process. So um, let's go into some of the asset classes. So these are the 15 most commonly recognized assets, stocks, equities, the stock market, it's basically where you own shares in companies. Bonds. So that's where governments, municipalities, and corporations issue debt products. Real estate, property. Most people know what property is. This residential house or a commercial factory, you know, residential, commercial, industrial, et cetera. Cash and cash equivalents. So again, your money that's sitting in the bank. Commodities. So that's like gold, silver, oil, natural gas, wheat, corn, et cetera. Mutual funds. So that's where it's just pooled funds, multiple investors going into multiple different things. If you remember yesterday, most of the people that that you know spoke about diversification said, be careful of this because this is just a spray and pray approach. Exchange traded funds. So they are similar, but they traded on stock exchanges and they're much more cost effective. Uh, derivatives, they basically contracts with the underlying asset with options, futures and swaps. I've got no idea what they are. They're far too complicated. I, I like simplicity in my life. Um, currencies, so again, people trade and buy and sell currencies. 10, private equity. So ownership in private companies, not public companies. Hedge funds in vehicles that pool capital from accredited investors to employ in various investment strategies. Venture capital, investing in early stage companies. Arts and collectibles. 
think that's fairly expl explanatory. Cryptocurrencies, the flavor of the month in the last 10 years, and infrastructure, roads, dams, energy, utilities, et cetera, in terms of that process. So those are the top 15 that people recognize. Now, one thing that I just want to clarify for you quickly, primary versus the secondary market. So I don't want to go too deep here because I don't want to confuse you. And I'm conscious of the fact that Gary is coming to join us. But the primary market is not on the stock exchange. So the secondary market is where you've got an asset that's been listed on the stock exchange. And you and I can go and buy and sell you know, shares on the stock exchange. So what happened over the last 40 years is that technology came in and it completely democratized access to the secondary market, to the stock market. Anywhere in the world now, whether it's Robin Hood in America or Easy Equities in South Africa, anyone can invest you know, in the stock market with, with virtually you know, one rand or 10 rand or one dollar or whatever it is. You can literally get in with, with virtually no barrier to entry. The primary market, which are the assets that are not listed on the stock exchange, that is where the next democratization will come because they're much more difficult to get into. And what's happening now and going to happen over the next couple of decades is that the wealthiest people have invested a huge amount of their resources. You're going to learn tomorrow what the top 500,000 wealthiest people invest in in terms of asset allocation. And, and more than 50% is in the primary market. And yet the majority of you watching this statistically are not even in the primary market because it hasn't been democratized like the secondary market. So I'm just giving you an overview quickly. I, I, I can't go too deep into this and I don't want to confuse you. Now let's go to why no residential in that process. And I want to explain to you what the value chain of real estate is. I call kind of just residential investing, mom and pop investing, buying a house, buying an apartment. And the current system, you know, that we most, most of us know is broken. You know, you and I invest in a property. You know, there's um, many, many different fees all the way through the process. In fact, there's about 16 different middlemen. There's no trust. There's no transparency. There's high fees and no alignment. And the myth, you know, for, for a lot of people and what a lot of people don't understand is myth number four is that, you know, you go out and you read a book like uh, Real Estate Riches, and it says, you know, go out and buy houses. And most people have kind of come to the conclusion that, you know, they need to go out and buy residential houses or apartments. But what I learned the hard way and having helped two and a half thousand people buy houses or apartments is that real money is not made in, in residential houses or apartments. It really isn't. There's too many middlemen. There's too many costs. There's too much friction. And I want to explain this to you. So this is the value chain of real estate. You've got land zoning, then you've got the developer, then you've got the investor, then you've got a fund or REIT, and then you've got UI. Let's look at the returns. A land developer is looking to make an average return of about 30% a year. A developer is looking to make about 25% a year. An investor is looking to make about 20% a year. And then how they make their money is they, they, they season the rent and then they sell that to a fund, like a pension fund or a REIT, a real estate investment trust. Now, they buy a stable income. Like think about when you put your money into the pension, what do you want? You want to get a stable return. So they buy a stable return. And depending on where they are in the world, they'll buy it for sort of 5 to 8%. And that's where the most money is made, from the investor selling stabilized income to funds. And then you and I come along, you know, and through the stock market and through financial planners and the financial industry, and we invest, and then we wonder why we battle to beat inflation. Now, again, you can go read an article on LinkedIn, um, literally about where the same company that was owned by one person was both the developer and, you know, the investor and the fund. And it talks about how, you know, so much money was made all the way through the process, except for the final investors at the end that bought overpriced assets. So the question I've got for people is if it's so logical that this is the value chain of real estate, why don't you just go up the value chain? Why don't you just cut out the middlemen? You know, when we use Uber, because most people understand Uber, you know, in the old days, I had to pick up my phone. You know, if I arrived at an airport, London airport, 
and I had to phone a taxi owners association and they had to phone the taxi owner who had to phone the taxi driver. Two hours later, the person would arrive. There were a whole bunch of costs. They were generally very rude. If I didn't know my way around London, they would go you know, the long way to charge me extra fees. And now I come out the airport and I literally, with technology, it just puts me directly in contact, cuts out all the middlemen, cuts the costs, dramatically increases the trust, the transparency, and the accessibility. I mean, how many people now have a private driver? Every single person who has a cell phone. So the question is, when it comes to property, I say to people, why don't you do the same thing? Why don't you go up the value chain and cut out the middleman? in terms of that process. And most of the answers I get are, I don't know how there's too many scams, there's too much compliance, management issues, time and effort, it's complicated. I don't have time, it sounds too good to be true. How do I protect myself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on and on and on in terms of all the different excuses I've heard all through the years. And <clears throat> you know, myth number five, and there's 10 golden myths that, that I've learned over the last 28 years. But myth number five is I don't have you know, the, um, the the money. And that again, you know, just like the stock market was democratized over the last 40 years, is not true anymore. Because, you know, you can now access quality information, quality partners with as little as, you know, $10 or whatever. You know, myth number six, I don't have the time. You know, sure, you don't have the time to do what Michael did and fly over to America and come and meet all the partners on the ground and come and see all the properties and then fly to England and come and meet all the partners in England and then fly to Europe and meet all the partners in Europe and then fly to, to Australia and meet all the partners in Australia. Like people don't have the time. And that's why, you know, we've compressed time. I mean, that's why for, for the, the most busy people, the most successful people, we created the mastermind because we were like, let's take decades and turn them into days. Let's go and get the best information and deliver it in the most condensed format so that people can make the right decisions for themselves. And then, you know, myth number seven is I don't have the knowledge. And I'm like, well, well done for you for being here because let's go out and find the best partners. Let's bring them to you. Let's teach them. You're going to learn from, from two incredible people today. Um, you know, the first being Gary. And he will share with you the knowledge. You can go and learn about London property for 20 years. Trust me, he's forgotten what you don't even know. So I like to use this metaphor of Uber because we all understand it. You know, again, as I've shared with you before, before Uber came, it was hugely confusing, hugely difficult. And this was actually a picture of one of my work colleagues who left his, his, his cell phone in the car. And the Uber guy came back to give it to him. And just like Uber has democratized the entire process, now you can literally cut out the middlemen. You can invest directly as an investor at an income level. So, I mean, Gary's going to share with you how you can literally invest in London residential property like an institutional investor. Or you can partner alongside a developer and actually invest directly in developments. So what don't we do? And there's eight you know, golden rules that we, we stick to. Firstly, we don't like assets where you need to pay an expert. You know, something where it's super complicated, like derivatives that I actually have no idea what they are and I don't understand them. I like to keep it simple. You know, this property here, I understand it. It's got replacement value. It earns an income. It makes sense. The second thing we don't do, we like to focus on assets with income. You know, unless it's part of our timing portfolio, but particularly on where the world is now, you saw my weighting of 70%. We really like to focus on income producing assets. We don't like assets that are short term volatile and high maintenance. So like day trading on the stock market or derivatives or currency trading, you know, that's flipping highly stressful. You've got to watch your computer every three seconds. If something goes wrong, you can lose a huge amount of money, you know, property and private equity and other alternative assets are much more steady eddy, which is a lot less risky and a lot less um, uh, anxiety provoking. Assets we don't understand. So for me, you know, again, simplicity is power. Um, it takes time. And, you know, really, it's important to try and understand the assets and keep it simple. Um, assets which mom and pops do, you know, so what, what I've learned over the last 10 years is that most middle class and professionals go out and they buy houses and apartments and they all compete with each other. And that's why the returns are not great because there's so much uh, demand and not that much supply. And so the returns aren't great. The moment you get out of the mom and pops, the moment you invest like the top 1% or like the institutions, there's a lot less competition. And the moment there's a lot less competition, you get far better opportunities with a lot less risk. It's kind of a no brainer. 
Number six is assets where you can't get the right information. So as an example, China. You know, there's been a huge opportunity in China for the last 20 years. I've been going to China since 2003. But to get the right information on the ground is extremely, extremely difficult. Or what about partners? You know, we've been wanting to go into India for since 2017. I've gone to India multiple times since 2017. And up until recently, in the last year and a half, we've been battling to find partners on the ground that we could really trust. And so it's all about getting the right information and the right partners. And then finally, assets in countries we don't understand. You know, there might be a massive opportunity at the moment in Brazil. I'm making it up. But I don't know. I've never been to Brazil. I don't understand the market there. And so we tend to stick to the markets we do know. England, Australia, America, Europe, all of those markets, or particularly England, Australia, and America. In England, I've been investing for 20 plus years. In America, uh, uh, 12 years now. Australia, 14, 15 years. Um, Germany and, and those markets, we, we've, we're partnering with partners that have been doing it for more than a decade. And so we tend to go to markets where we already know and understand the market in terms of that process. So taking that into account, let's look at those 15 again in terms of the top you know, 15. Um, and so we don't do stocks. We don't do bonds. We do do real estate. We don't talk about cash and equivalents, although you know, people should, you know, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, we do do commodities. We don't do mutual funds. We do do exchange traded funds. Ann Wilson um, is an amazing friend and probably one of the best in the world to explain this. And I've got a wonderful gift to give you. Um, we don't do derivatives. We don't do currency. Um, we do do private equity. We don't do hedge funds. We do do venture capital. We don't do, at the moment, art and collectibles. We do do cryptocurrency and we do do infrastructure. So again, just a quick synopsis of the top 15. But the 15 that we focus on at the moment and the 15 that we go through in detail as part of Wealth Going Global and then with the mastermind, every single month we cover this um, in asset mastery. So we spend 90 minutes going deep into each asset class. I bring in a partner that I've known for a long time that actually, because they, they're doing it on the ground and they come and explain how the asset class works, what the fundamentals of the asset class are, what the opportunities are, what the risks are, and how to actually um, partake in them in terms of what's looking at. So the first one is uh, multifamily. So this is, uh, and Shane, just please give me a shot once uh, Gary um, uh, turns up, if that's cool. It was Scott, yeah, Gary is here, I'm standing by, so I'll tell him when to come on. Okay, awesome, okay, great. So I, I'll just, um, I'm just gonna wrap up the top 15 then. So the first one is uh, commercial real estate multifamily. So this is mainly known in America. It's where you buy, rather than buying one apartment, you buy the entire building that'll have like 300 apartments. They, they tend to refer to them as doors. And the nice thing is, is that you've got a lot of diversification, a lot of different income streams. There's a lot of methodologies as to how to create value in that space. And it's been one of the flavors of the month. It is one of the things where the institutions have piled a hell of a lot of money into the space over the last 10 years. And it's actually had the best risk adjusted return over the last 10 years in America in the property real estate space. The second is industrial. So again, you know, particularly with COVID and e-commerce, uh, industrial is factories and it's mainly around logistics. We actually just did a deal in Phoenix um, at the end of July, that was logistics. And Phoenix is one of the top three cities in America. It's a 7% uh, income return, cash on cash return in dollars, and uh, 15, uh, sorry, 17% IRR in terms of that space. The third one is MOB, medical office building. This has been a very, very resilient asset class. It's pretty much all the medical buildings that, that support the hospital. Um, the only challenge is I've stood on stage for 10, 12 years, telling everyone how wonderful it is. And then COVID came along and suddenly the doctors couldn't do any you know, discretionary surgeries and a lot of the income streams dried up and it actually had a really tough time during COVID. Now, does that mean it's not a good asset class? No, it's just gone through a very tough time. And funny enough, on Thursday, um, Bruce Saunders, who's been my partner in, in America since 2013, is going to be explaining what's happening in the market and what you need to know about it. Office space, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. All those high-rise you see and, um, you know, the people that rent office and 
I'm sure most people will know that there's a lot of vacancies in big cities around the world. So how do you how do you take advantage of that opportunity? Co-living. So this is one of the fastest growing asset classes in, in Europe um, and, and now coming into Australia. And, and I'll let Gary talk about whether it's coming in England. But ultimately, it's where you've got shared living. It's, it's, it's not student accommodation. It's for young professionals. It's highly, highly um, effective. And, you know, again, at an institutional level, it's showing very good returns. Then you've got London Residential, and we're very privileged today to have Gary to come talk to us about this, because, you know, whether it's Gary, and, and uh, I know a mutual friend of Gary's and I is called Ben, you know, he's a very, very wealthy investor in England. And no matter which asset class you look at, people still need homes, they still need houses, they still need accommodation. But the point being is, how do you do it at scale, like an institution, and not have to deal with all the rubbish and the riffraff that the mom and pop investors tend to deal with? First mortgage debt. So this has become very, very popular around the world where you, you effectively take debt on a property. Um, you, you, you often you act like the bank. You actually get the first mortgage over the property. Uh, we got an opportunity coming up in Manhattan at the moment uh, with a 12% return, which is a first mortgage debt uh, in Manhattan, New York. Then you've got retail, fairly self-explanatory with retail. It's shopping centers, strip malls, et cetera. <laughs> You've got to be very careful in the sector. You certainly got our partners that know what they're doing. Then you've got senior living and aged care. Obviously, particularly in the Western world, people are getting older and, and need senior living and aged care. So it's all the resources and the facilities that, that support that. You've got ETFs. So this is a way to get into the stock market where you have you know do it in the most cost-effective way. And as I said, I've got a gift from Ann Wilson that I want to share with you with regards to that. Structured notes. So this is an asset class I only learned about in 2019. And what's interesting is that the wealthiest people have been investing in these for decades, and yet most of us didn't know about them. You need $2 million just to participate. And in simple terms, when you go to a bank, you've got retail banking, you've got wholesale banking, and you've got institutional banking. And what technology has allowed us to do is invest at an institutional level and get institutional returns, not retail returns. And I mean, this is exactly why we're about to go to Gary. It's the same thing. Do you want to get retail returns or do you want to get institutional returns? Gold and silver, self-explanatory. Someone like Robert Kiyosaki and them go on and on and on about the fact we should be in gold with the world collapsing and you know all the all the, the comments people make. Private equity, again, I've talked about this where you invest directly in companies. I did show you yesterday that you know, according to the research over the last 20 to 25 years, private equity has outperformed um, the stock market. It's had better results, lower risk, and you know it's certainly something that you need to be looking at in your portfolio. And again, tomorrow, we've got Anthony coming to talk about asset allocation, and he helps manage the money of 60 of the wealthiest families. So why not come and learn from them? Venture capital, <clears throat> this is more high risk, but it's actually where you invest in companies. Um, you know, and maybe you get it right. Maybe you next invest in the next Facebook or the next Uber or you know, whatever it is, but you can you also get it very wrong and uh, lose all your money. So make sure that you've got the right partners there. And then finally, crypto and, you know, what it's all about uh, when it comes to crypto. And I have spoken about it a little bit, but I now want to pivot uh, to my partner and 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 good friend in England, um, Gary. If you do want more and you want to know more about these assets, you know, I've just done a very quick overview and, you know, we call it asset class mastery. You can you can go and look at it where we go into these assets in a lot more detail. And a classic example is actually in August when Gary came along and he shared with with us what is happening in the in the London market. You know, why are the opportunities there? I've known Gary since uh, I don't remember the exact year, two thousand six, two thousand seven, and I was actually helping investors invest directly in his buildings in London, um, in a place called Canary Wharf. And it's been fascinating watching him as he's evolved. Um, he's been a developer in, in London since 1988. And I'd love to um, bring Gary on. And Gary, please, if you're there, can we switch your camera on? I can see that you're trying. There you come. Can we hear you? No, we can't hear you.
What is it with Zoom this week? <laughs> we couldn't hear Michael yesterday, and now we can't hear you. Uh, I tell you what, Gary, could you can just you have, uh, log? Uh, can you have yeah, we got you. Oh, thank goodness. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I had the <laughs> same stress yesterday when Michael couldn't connect. Gary, it's wonderful to have you online. Thanks for jumping on. Um, you know, it's always a privilege and a pleasure to learn from people that are on the ground doing it. I always joke with people, we could bring in Harvard University professors and I don't know, you know, London Business School economics professors, and they tell us all the rhetoric about what's happening in the market. Or we could do it with someone that, you know, owns hundreds of millions of pounds, has developed billions of pounds, and probably has a better pulse on what's happening in the market. So do me a favor. Give us the pricey version of your story, how you got to London, and you know how you ended up being one of the biggest developers in, in London. Well, not one of the biggest, but we've done okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I left South Africa in 1987 when I was two. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I finished university. I went to Wits, came to England, um, actually started a little furniture shop, um, and kind of instead of waiting for customers to come in, I, I went out looking to all the state agents furniture and just a little bit of history of you own the furniture. So in other words, if uh, the, the, the tenant owned the furniture, it was difficult to get them out because their goods and chattels were there. So I kind of transitioned from there to kind of being in the early 90s was a bit of a property boom. And slowly but surely, I started buying a flat here and a flat there and turning them and et cetera, et cetera, and selling them. Until that went into developments and uh, uh, we'll buy a whole development, as you talk about, but we didn't hold them. We didn't have the capital to hold, so we kind of flipped them. It was much easier in those days in terms of getting mortgages, et cetera. Um, we, uh, and then we kind of transitioned into saying, you know what, why are we selling this stuff? Can we not keep it? And um, most of the time, we, we we used our own capital and made it sweat and built up a business um, that today we are holding nearly a thousand units uh, with another 300 in the pipeline. Um, and really the basis of this is, uh, I'm sure a lot of you um, on the call know Nate Kirsch. And in 2009, it was impossible to get debt. And we had a development going up just to the east of Canary Wharf at the Excel Center where the, where the cable car is. And um, Nate, he funded me and he said to me at the time, he said, Gary, you know, he said, I will, um, he said, I'll go into this deal. He said, uh, we've checked you out. We, we think you're honest, et cetera. He said, but um, he said, I don't know how clever you are, but even stupid people can make money in property. He said, just don't sell it. And, so and that's just, very true. Just, just, to, just to repeat it there. Sorry, because I, yeah. I know you well and you drop these little gems in and people miss them. So just remind everyone what you just said there from one of the wealthiest people in the world. He said to me, he said, Gary, I'm not worried about doing this deal with you because even stupid people can make money in property. Just don't sell it. Which is great. But, you know, you, you have to generate capital to uh, to keep on building. So, you know, you can get to a point where the market gives you a lot of luck and or you can create equity by, for example, planning plays where you buy a piece of land and, and you get a planning permission, et cetera. It's just the higher risk stuff that creates equity. And then you've got imputed equity. And that's how we've done it up to now. And in fact, now we're kind of looking at um, external capital to come in and uh, and, and and to fund us. Um, but um, And that ultimately is where we're going. So you have to understand there's been a transition in England. Um, England's famous for saying, you know, your, your house is your castle. And that's always been you know, people always trying to buy their own property. So just to give an idea, in England, home ownership sits at about 65% of the population, which is enormous. That is absolutely enormous. But what's happened, and it's happened in the world, is as costs have gone up and as prices have gone up, the, 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 it becomes more and more difficult to buy properties. Uh, it, it was easy in the, up to the financial crash in 2007 because credit was available. As credit tightened up, it became very, very difficult to, to, to buy property. So there's been a transition to rental property. Now, that really comes down to the credit markets, because if you think about it, rent is the, far, is the ultimate form of credit. Okay, so, you know, if you go back 60, 70 years ago, 
the, the credit first consumer credit was ready on cars. And that was because the, the car manufacturers making a huge margin. How do they um, get more cars sold is they offer credit. Okay. So, you know, and as long as they, and then they're actually making money on both sides. They're making money on the margins of the cars and on the credit. So what's happened in England is as prices have gone up, credit and credit has tightened up, the rental market has increased. Plus, I think it's included as a, as a general world position of a more of a, a nomad generation where people want to be flexible, want to move. I would guess that out of choice, people would prefer to be homeowners, but they justify being rentals, uh, uh, having a rental, uh, being in a rental because they kind of think it's kind of trendy, et cetera. And you can kind of get more value. What you don't have to do is invest in a massive deposit. So actually over a life cycle of someone that is renting on a cash flow basis, it probably works. You know, if you if you offset the additional rent you're paying to what it might cost you on a mortgage and you take the cash flow of the deposit, it's probably about break even. But what that's created is it's changed the rental market in the UK quite dramatically. So from moving from a single, maybe a portfolio of four or five units as people see as a pension for themselves, which as you uh, alluded before, starts becoming a nuisance to run. And, and that's mainly because if you have a portfolio of five and one tenant doesn't pay rent, you, you've got a 20% uh, hit on, on, on your portfolio. Even, even worse, most international investors have a portfolio of one. And then if that oh, tenant correct. Pay, correct. So, Scott, if you, trouble. I mean, if you go back a few years, we kind of pioneered rental guarantees. Yeah. And the reason we did rental guarantees was not so much when, and this, by the way, is when we were selling stock. And the reason we did rental guarantees was not so much to um, get better prices on our properties. It was to give the confidence, okay, to um, buyers that they knew their cash flow was secure. And so if you think about it, we had a development of 100 units and Joe Bloggs bought one unit and, and uh, uh, Dave Smith bought a second unit. One of them would rent out first and one of them would rent out second. One of them may have a tenant paying or not, et cetera. So if you do that over 100 and you consolidate that on, say, a rental guarantee position, that risk is reduced dramatically, okay? So, so and reducing the risk, and what, what you really want is investment in property. You've got to understand property is a long-term investment. If you make money on property in the short term, it's because you're lucky with the market, and you can't predict that. You have to actually be lucky. You can take certain factors, which which is what we're doing, and kind of use those factors to your advantage. So just for example, like we're noticing now, there's a huge lack of supply. So one can turn around and say, well, if you look at a macroeconomic position. Well, if you, supply, don't, mind, if you don't mind, I'm actually just going to chuck up a slide of yours from when you presented in August. Just, just, with, uh, just while you're talking about this, just so people can actually see what you're talking about. Oh, okay, fantastic. Okay, so so we've kind of adopted a, a, a kind of a macro policy on the basis that you've got to look at 10, 15 years on property to really get your income. Otherwise, you, you, you create a market risk. And we kind of say, well, use what we understand to reduce that risk. We're all about risk uh, uh, um, reduction on the basis that even stupid people can make money in property, just don't sell it over the long term. Okay, and don't get me wrong, if we get offers on properties that are fantastic, we will sell, but our preference is not to. Um, the, and also, by the way, you reduce a lot of frictional costs, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So, so we take the, 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 the um, macro philosophy on property and say, well, demand is restricted. So if you think about it, what we've gone through since 2007, we had a, a, a financial crash. The markets really dipped. But they came back quite strongly because there was a huge wedge of cash waiting for a, a dip market. And we had a good run between, say, 2012 and 2016. We kind of then started tightening up. Then COVID came, reduced construction. No new developments were really started during uh, COVID. We finished a 700-unit development throughout the period of COVID. So we were very fortunate. Um, cost increases went up dramatically. So uh, uh, viabilities that um, developers had done stopped working. Um, we then moved into this high interest rate environment. And um, for those of a similar uh, age to me, which probably not that many of you there, but, um, you know, um, 
I lived in South Africa at one stage with 20, 25% interest rates. So, so the generation that exists now is very used to low interest rates. I don't believe interest rates are going to drop for another two, three years. To, and I don't think we'll see for a long time that one, two percent positions. So that has dramatically uh, 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 stopped supply. Um, it's particularly in London. And by the way, Scott, as you know, we London centric. Okay. Yeah, well, I was about to. I mean, I was about to pivot once you finished on the fundamentals of supply and demand. I was actually going to pivot to this one of why London. You know, because again. It's one of the capital cities of the world, but I'll let you talk about it. But ultimately, I, I don't think there's many investors that don't want at some point say they own a piece of London. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, the, the, the benefit of London is the stability of the legal system, okay, or, or of England as a, as a macro. As a micro, everybody really wants to be in London and England. If you look at the demographics of the country, there's this huge kind of swathe up north, etc., and there's this kind of leveling up policy. But the truth is, people live out of London, on the whole, in places like Birmingham or Manchester, because they can't afford London. And what you're finding is London is um, uh, equalizing with those areas because there's been a bit of a boom in Birmingham, Manchester. But you, what you find is in a down market, and that's how we plan. We plan, we plan for a down market. So if we can't make something work in, uh, in, in, the, in the bad uh, times, we don't, we don't want it. Okay, so um, and 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 so London is pretty strong, and the, the shortage in London is dire. So just to give you an idea, London needs about sixty or seventy thousand new units per annum, and I, I think like the average over the last five six years is probably eighteen, maybe twenty thousand. So it's it, it, it's created a real shortage. That's when Scott was you talk about co living. So co living is happening. There's, there's what can happen is you can get smaller units. Uh, so what happens, you get like a unit going, an average unit, say, 650 square foot, 700 square foot becomes 300 square foot. The, the only problem with a unit like that is you, it's, you can only sell it for the income. You can't get any capital growth because you can't split it. So you have to sell it as a building. What we've opted to go for is a, is a mixture between the two. So we are taking regular blocks, which can be split up, but consolidating them. And the theory behind that, having dealt with the macro side of why we're doing it, the theory is how do we reduce frictional costs? Okay, so when you're a developer, you're going to develop, and if you take your cost, the general margin, profit margin for a developer is between 20 and 10%. Okay, so let's just talk, say, 15% profit on the, the gross uh, development value, the GDP of the development. So as a business, if we can be uh, um, vertically integrated, that 15% margin is we keep them. Now you take out the frictional costs. We don't have sales costs. That's going to charge, that's going to cost the developer 5% of any development. We don't have further stamp duties, okay, to hold the stock. So if I sold an individual property to an individual investor, they're going to be paying me my 15%. They're going to be paying 5% of the cost that I've had added on for sales costs. They're going to be paying stamp duties. You know, it doesn't take you long to get to 18 percent and then when you take the margins at 18 percent that's quite a big difference and um, we also an environment obviously where we've got increasing costs okay and a limited land supply so for anybody that understands basic economics sorry if you don't mind i'm just going to close the door because my dogs are going crazy just bear with me so just a couple of things to simplify what gary's saying in simple terms when he's talking about cutting the friction costs what he's saying is just cutting out the middlemen and if you remember where I showed you the value chain of real estate, I said you could be investing at the end, which is what Gary's just saying, with all these costs all the way along, and that dilutes your return. That's why you never get out of the middle class because your returns are middle class returns, or you can go up the value chain, cut out all the middleman, and, and that's exactly what Gary's talking about. And of course, by the way, Scott, you, you're reducing the risk, as I said before, because you've got a development of 100 units. Okay, and you're going to have a small percentage of bad debts. I think our our, our non-payers and our voids run at about one and a half or two percent, which is very low, very very low. So we're running, um, as you know, we we actually have just sold it, but we owned a uh, an estate agency which we started from scratch called Life Residential, where where we managed the properties. We we sold it last week actually, but we were running five thousand properties in London, and. Um, I think our, our voids were like 45. You know, it was unbelievable. So, you know, everything is kind of 
brewing to make a really good cup of coffee in the residential market in London. Okay, so what you're finding is there's a lot of capital coming in for, for what they call build to rent, BTR, so kind of professional landlords. What's that, what that's done is it's increased the quality of the properties to some degree, but it's also increased the prices because what happens is now you've got commercial competition. So I'm building a building. I need to put in a bloody nice gym. I need to make a, a, a community that people want to live. So it's all about customer retention. And suddenly, instead of us being, um, instead of us being a landlord, we're actually a, 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 we're a business with customers. So we don't have tenants, we have customers. We, and we treat our customers like hotel guests. Of course, that's got slight increase in, 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 in costs, but the relative cost increase is far less than the relative rent increase we can get because people feel part of the community, they feel uh, uh, valued, et cetera. And, um, so, uh, and that's kind of the, the direction that we have gone and that we are going in. Okay, so we're trying to... And then the risk profile of the development, of course, is what you do. Do you buy a piece of land and take the risk of getting planning? And you must understand when you do that, if you don't get the planning, you, you, you've kind of lost your money. You, you, you've got a mini field, okay? Um, if, uh, if, if, um, if you can get that margin, that's how you make your most margin. So, you know, it's, it's a risk return. The development risk, we don't really see as a risk because we tend to close our contracts in terms of the construction, et cetera. So just to give an example, through COVID, okay, we built, as I said, we, we, we built the tallest tower in West London, 57 stories, 700 units. And that was constructed through COVID. And believe it or not, our planning, our entire planning came from Wuhan. Okay, so you can imagine our, our, our kind of blood pressure when COVID started. And... Um, and, but we closed the contract with the contractor. So we had no zero cost increases. In fact, we, we agreed to pay, I think on a 200 million pound contract, we agreed to pay one and a half million dollars. And that was shipping costs because uh, shipping containers went up hugely during COVID. And, and so we agreed to pay some of the costs. And it was just the gesture of goodwill because of the amount of business we do with the contractor. And, and, and the Chinese uh, uh, cladding company also took some of a hit. So we kind of reduced that risk. And um, uh, um, so the development risk we're quite comfortable with. We, we're super comfortable with the, with the rental risk because uh, the supply and demand, it just, it's going to take, uh, I don't think it's soluble, actually, or solvable, actually, is the word. It, it, it will take 20 years at London at full capacity to build, to catch up, to actually provide the stock. The planning system in England is so bureaucratic and so difficult to navigate. And i just give you an example when I say about costs and difficulty of planning and restriction of demand. As you know, very sadly, there was the fire in London at Grenfell Tower. Now, the fire at Grenfell happened. It was a, a perfect storm. The building had bad cladding put on, it had uh, no fire sprinkler system, et cetera, et cetera. So, if you compare that building to one of our buildings, it's completely different. It's chalk and cheese, right? So we have full uh, fire. We, in fact, we have the highest possible fire rating in our buildings. But what, in their wisdom, they decided to do was to say to anybody building a tower, and it went from 18 meters, uh, from 30 meters and above, down to 18 meters. Now, think about 18 meters. That's not that tall a building. That's like kind of... I don't know, seven Sorry. stories, six, seven no. stories. And they said, right, you have to have a second means of escape, a second staircase. Now, the rules in a tall building from a fire perspective is stay where you are because you've got a fire system that works and that functions individually in every single room in our building. So obviously, they, they, they kind of cracked enough with the sledgehammer and decided to put two staircases. Now, think about what that happens in a building. You're just taking out 10% of your usable space which increases the costs. So you, you have a situation where a lot of developments aren't viable and a lot of architects have had to go back to the drawing board and redraw it. So that's just another addition to, to the restriction on supply. So when you look at it like that and you say, okay, we've taken out the, we, we, we understand the development risk, we understand the rental risk, we, um, we, we understand about taking the frictional costs, you can start working to getting a fairly decent return. Now, the cash and cash return starts becoming damn close to what the banks are paying now. Okay, of course it's not liquid, 
but it's a cash and cash return. And I keep saying, I have friends that come to me uh, and say, you know, you've done okay in the property business. Can we buy a flat for our kids, etc.? And I always say to them, I say, you have to understand. I'll send you the flat. I'll give you the biggest discount I can. But you have to promise me, okay, you're going to keep it for at least 10 to 15 years. And I say to them always, and just to be sure that there's no misunderstanding, I'll give you a guaranteed buyback in 15 years at the cost you're paying today. So you cannot lose money. Okay, the absolute number. Of course, you're going to lose the income, but you cannot lose money because that's how confident we are in terms of, of, of the prices going up. And you just have to look, you know, when I come back to South Africa, I, I just think of a place like Shelly Beach where my parents had a timeshare uh, in 1980, uh, say three, there was nothing there. There was a row of townhouses on the beach. Now there's a whole city. Okay, and that's like over a period. And the same is happening in London. Uh, you might be able to... Um, you might be able to show a couple of the slides of what I'm talking about, Scott, um, about the regeneration. We stand, we no, tend... I go, so, so just before we go to regeneration, Gary, I want to go there. But just before we go there, there's a question from Stephen, and I think it sort of sums up with, with this slide I wanted to show. So <laughs> when you're an international investor, the first thing you get offered often is, uh, is Birmingham and Manchester and Liverpool, and there's lots of students and they need lots of student accommodation. And uh, developers kind of sell to them. And I mean, I've heard this story. You and I have been doing this nearly 20 years together. And I've heard this story so many times. And, and I'm virtually almost yet to find people that make money doing this. I'll never forget in Manchester, where 100 South Africans bought, you know, student accommodation. But it was 20 miles. I mean, that's like 36 kilometers from university. And when I was at university, trust me, I didn't want to live 36 kilometers from campus. Like, I need to say they couldn't rent it out. Like, you know what I mean? So these things all sound a hell of a good on paper. And then you have real life happening. And I just want to kind of reiterate, I've got a question and a, I've got a comment and a question for you quickly before we go to the regeneration. This for me is the difference between what I'm going to call that mom and pop investing, which is where I can't afford London. So I tell you what, I'm going to go to Liverpool or Manchester and I'm going to buy an old house and I'm supposedly going to renovate it long distance, by the way, which is now an impossible. Then I'm going to manage it. Then I've got one tenant with one you know, management agent they're hopefully going to get it. Um, and there's all these risks or... I can invest with a partner that literally is building the development, is owning the development alongside me, is managing the development and cutting out all the middlemen. And that just, I want to try and explain to people, that's the difference between what I call mom and pop investing and institutional investing, which is what Gary is trying to explain. I don't know, Gary, if you've got any comments on that before we move to the regeneration. Well, I, just reading Steve's question. So, Steve, you're quite correct. In, 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 there's been a huge flood of capital into the student market here. Um, uh, um, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it, it kind of defies belief, really, with the amount of quantity that's happening. But what you find is that people jump on a bandwagon and eventually there'll be oversupply. But, but people doing that are competing with funds. You've got massive American funds. You've got massive university endowments that are buying these properties and, and it's difficult to compete with them. So, yes. You, you're getting a return. How do you, the capital returns on a student development? He has a very subtle point you have to understand. Okay, the, the returns on a student development are purely based on income. Okay, so if let's just say, for example, you've got income at five percent, you've invested a million pounds, right? Your income at five percent, so you've got 50 grand coming off your investment. That money is valued purely at a multiple of an investment. So if the market and the cap rates on student accommodation is say 4%, you'll get a multiple of 25 on your income. Okay, and, and if, if, if interest rates go up, that will reduce, okay? You might be expected to get 6% and then you've got a multiple of 15.5, whatever the case is. Okay, so on residential property, you have the income, the value you can also sell because of the build to rent market, you can also sell on the cap rates. And by the way, if you look at any of the cap rates in the UK, residential property is the heart, is the best cap rate and the most stable cap rate, right through COVID, right through running between at one stage 3.25 to uh, uh, now it's sitting at four, whereas like the equivalent commercial is sitting at a cap rate of 6%. Okay, so the multiples are much more. But if you split up that building, you can also get the capital growth. Now you're talking about price per square foot. Okay, so, so, so income is generally based 
not on price per square foot. It, it, it's based on the market, etc. Price per square foot often has no correlation in a buyer's market has no correlation. I mean, I've been in an exhibition in Hong Kong when we, you know, 20 years ago, where we'd go in and we started on a Friday selling properties at 650 pounds a square foot. And by Sunday, we're selling at 800 pounds a square foot, okay, which is, which is like ridiculous. Um, so that is the one fundamental understanding of what we do in terms of rental, okay? So your, your exit and your IRRs and exit can be much, much higher than, than, than say what a student ultimately can be, okay? A student accommodation. Very stable, great business, and there's been a huge uh, surge. The, the, if you just look at the planning applications, people are planning uh, a student and co-living, but it's really simple, why? Because you're going to, they smaller units, and you're going to get higher income on a smaller unit. You know, you're going to get relatively more on a one bed flat as opposed to two bed flat from from a cost perspective. Okay, but but how do you sell that? You can only sell it based on the income. So you're not getting involved in property. You're getting involved in capital markets. Okay, and the people that should really get involved in capital markets are, are banks, funds that deal in money. And for the individual investor, you're not really dealing in money. You, you know, you're not saying, oh, I've got 50 pounds here and tomorrow I'm going to invest it here and then I'm going to put it there, etc. You have to look at a long term uh, a strategy. Our, 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 our strategy actually is so simple and so old fashioned, but it works. In fact, I had a, 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 a guy, a big agent in London said, you know, Gary, I've known for you for years. He says, you're one of the only guys that I know is still doing the same thing you were doing 25, 30 years ago. But, you know, it's kind of old fashioned landlord and tenant, but do it in a much better way. I, I, I recommend a really good book where, where, and the philosophy that we look at from a tenant perspective is um, the, the guy that started Four Seasons Hotel, Isidore Shaw. And he has a great uh, uh, biography and, and where he says, put the customer first and foremost, okay? And everything else will follow, okay? So, sorry, Scott. And, and one other thing that we do is we tend to fix our interest rates. Okay, so in the good times, we kind of fix them. In the bad times, we let them float. Risk reduction. That's all we do, risk reduction. We, we don't expect to make massive money, but we will. When the markets boom, we will make a lot of money. But we make very solid returns. A couple of comments there. You've just taken people from a, from a you know, school level to an honors degree to a master's to a PhD, <laughs> talking about cap rates and everything. So, uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure right here, yeah. that went, went straight over their heads. But um, my point being is that it's that type of stuff where not only in the VIP, I'll go into a lot more detail if people want to understand it, plus wealth going global. I do, Gary, I want to stick, come back to the fundamentals. And one of the things that I've learned from you and, and been part of with you is focusing on regeneration areas. They talk in property, location, location, location. But equally, they say in property, try and buy property with a twist. So talk to us a little bit about just, you know, and, and I can put up the slides for you quickly. Um, you know, I don't expect people to be able to read all the slides, et cetera. But the point being is that if you want to just talk to us a little bit about the fundamentals of regeneration and then also why you now in West London and what the opportunity is in West London. Okay, so so the reason I'm in regeneration is because I could never afford to buy stuff in established areas. Okay, I could never create value. Whereas in a regeneration area, uh, uh, um, you, you can kind of, create value if you have the, the vision. And that's one of the things about my experience when I, I mentioned about Shelly Beach is when you, when you leave somewhere and go back over a period, you can really see the growth. So if you go back to Santon, for example, 30 years ago, there was nothing. And if you go there now, it's unbelievable, right? So um, what well, I mean, you, you've got a good you've got a good picture for. OK, most, so, so correct. So, so that's kind of on, on the left. On the left is kind of when I kind of came to England and, and I kind of liked Canary Wharf because you could go and rent something in an established area was a bit old, a bit damp, etc. And yet you could go to Canary Wharf and rent something that's fantastic. It goes back to how the customer feels. Like, and then and then we admittedly we rode that. So, and East London, the history of East London was it was seriously bombed out during World War II. And, and people, and, and, and so it created a great opportunity. Um, the buildings were built to a large extent because in the first instance it failed. 
Why? Because the infrastructure wasn't there. They hadn't put the tube line in, et cetera, et cetera. It's ultimately done, un it's unbelievable, the growth and the change. So we kind of looked at that and we happened, we happened to be based in West London and West London is going through a transition. And West London actually is a bit of a no-brainer because it's, it's much closer to the center of London, okay, than East London. But we were given a gift in the fact that um, they decided to build, I, I don't know if you guys follow the UK news, but you would have heard a lot about HS2 and it being cancelled. So HS2 is the high-speed rail link, which they were doing between London, Birmingham and Manchester. And in fact, they've just cancelled. It's gone so much over cost that they've just cancelled <laughs> the Birmingham to Manchester route. So we've ended up we've ended up in a situation where we have the largest station. On the left is... Uh, is what were shunting yards um and now you can see on on the right and uh, i could give you an updated photograph it's ridiculous the amount of construction and so there's become a whole town center so we are in this location we are by far the best connected position in london so we are in zone two so you imagine zone one zone two zone three of the tubes um canary wharf is zone three we're in zone two so we're much closer there's a map. And, um, there. Let me just find your and, map. There's your map there, basically. Just to, uh, to yeah, yeah. So if you kind of point out where West London, White City, you go a little bit left, stop a little bit left there. Well, oh, stop there. That White City, you may have heard of White City, a massive development, the largest shopping centre in uh, in London. And then you've got uh, to the right Westminster, uh, and then you've got Canary Wharf. But the, the point is, in West London, the infrastructure is there already because the Elizabeth Line, which runs east to west comes straight through there. It, um, then you've got HS2 and the tube. So that's why they chose the location because it's where all three transport facilities uh, 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 meet. And so the infrastructure is there already. So, and we kind of pioneers, if you're just looking at that picture that 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 Scott um, has on the right-hand side, just to give an idea, um, this picture is taken from the 57th floor of a building that we've built. And if you look in the, at the end of the triangle, but to your left with your mouse, that's that's another one of our buildings being built. That's going to be ready in April. We have another one across the road. That's one of the investments I'm talking to Scott about, about getting involved in, which is up to a third floor to be ready in about 18 months, 19 months time. Imagine in that triangle is going to be the largest single station in the whole of Europe, not in London, in the whole of Europe. Okay, so anybody coming from Birmingham will be coming and ending up there. So you've got a regeneration. And in fact, Scott, um, yesterday, um, you might well all know Ballymore. Ballymore, in my opinion, are the best developer in London. They are they create the best infrastructure. Well, just to the right of that development that I'm saying there, just if you go up, that, by the way, that big green area is called the Scrubs. It's like the third biggest park in London. And if you go just slightly up from there, there's a bunch of brown buildings. There you go, left, 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 right there. Ballymore has just announced they've done a deal with Sainsbury's. They're building two and a half thousand units there okay so if you think about what's going to cost them to build if you think about what our cost is because we're out the ground already and you think about the change in the area that growth could be huge okay so here's this investment philosophy okay so we're taking something which works today and giving you pretty good returns that by the way what you're seeing is on the, if you look in the right corner you can see the building before we built the area and what we built that's a great sign of regeneration and if you can have the vision to say where so scott will tell you a lot of people when i saw a building that building they said you're crazy now they think i'm a, a, a miracle maker so the this picture that scott has got up is we are built now the three orange buildings in front is imperial college Okay, they've got planning permission, they're about to start building. So that whole area is going to transfer. All that area that you can see behind is part of the HS2 redevelopment. That's all, and the station, it's all part of the HS2 redevelopment. So here's the investment, okay? We know, and we work on current rates, current in, uh, current rents versus current interest rates to make a return. You might not, you know, you might, um, you, you might not uh, uh, get the six, seven, eight percent return of cash and cash. Uh, uh, you're probably going to get net, net, net four, four and a half percent return cash and cash. But think about the massive growth between now and 15 years with the regeneration, where all of a sudden you sort of in central London, because central London is going to move towards the west because of the density levels. So 
and at that point in time, unlike student accommodation, you could choose to break up the building and sell individual units and think of what the cap growth is. So over the period, the cap growth is there. And, and we all have to look historically, how did our parents buy a house for uh, 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 10,000 pounds in 1960 foot sack, okay, and then end up with a house that's worth 2 million pounds today? How did that happen? in a relatively short space of time. Um, so, you know, um, I think that um, it's quite a subtle understanding to say. So my view is, if you'd say property is a long-term investment, you buy efficiently through reduction of frictional costs, okay? You end up and you hold it. You just have to hold it. And over time, you can grow it. It will grow naturally through supply and demand, increasing population. Okay, as, as they say, the, the, God has closed the factory of, of, of land. He's not building any more land. Okay, he's closed that factory. So supply is going to be re reduced. You're increasing costs, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the addition. Okay, you have the absolute addition of, um, of the regeneration factor. Just where, where my per square foot cost today is not going to show any relationship to the per square foot cost in the different place, a bit like a place like Santon becoming uh, uh, from going from one price to another price over a certain number of years. And that's really the philosophy of the strategy. And, and, and as I say, we've, we've always tried to do uh, uh, it ourselves and sweat our capital, but obviously you can't keep holding property without sweating capital unless you can get credit. So, and that's why we're looking to kind of consolidate and make a fund. This is this, what you're looking at now, by the way, is our platform for rentals, etc. cetera. Okay. I'm just um, so sorry, Paul, because um, they call them trophy assets, you know, aspirational, whatever you want to call it. And it's like so many people, you know, Gary, even when you and I were doing this 15 years ago, it, it took a hell of a lot of money even to buy one apartment. And then you had to go set up an offshore structure and you had to get a mortgage and then you had to manage the property and the hassle and everything in between. And, you know, what I love with what you're saying and in simple terms is that in the past you used to, you know, I would help work with you but we would help someone buy an apartment and then they were kind of on their own like go and you know go and own this apartment yeah there'll be a management agent whatever but it's kind of yours nowadays you can partner with you in the development you owning a piece of the building i'm owning a piece of the building you know joe soap's owning a piece of the building and we're holding it for five ten years and you've got a full management solution cutting all the middle then out uh, which obviously is increasing the return reducing the risk and you know when we exit there's multiple exit strategies, whether it's selling them off individually or selling them to an institution or whatever. Um, I mean, have I summed it up, you know, in simple terms yeah. for people? You know? you know what? Can I give the bottom line? We're in the business of not making money. We're in the business of not losing money. Okay. So we start off with the premise. We don't want to lose our money. That's, that's, the, that's the first thing. So if we break even, we're happy. We know that we'll make money over the long term. It just depends how patient you prepare to be. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, the fundamentals, right? So the, one of the biggest frictional costs now, of course, is finance. Okay, if I can be a cash builder and developer, okay, we probably pay 10% for our money just on the development side. So if you start stripping it back and you're cash and cash and you've got a group of investors and you're building for cash, okay, the margins are enormous, enormous, okay, but over a longer period. Yeah, uh, the IRR has become huge. Well, look, I've um, I've uh, I've squeezed more time out of you than uh, than I asked for. So you promised to give me 15, 20 minutes, and Cheryl said, "How can I get in touch?" You know, Cheryl, between Gary and I, we're going to be putting a, a an opportunity together. It's going to be on the Wild Migrate platform. People will be able to invest directly um, alongside you know with with Gary and the team from a partnership perspective. So yeah, just watch the space. It's literally funny enough, while Gary was on live, Ian Cohen, his partner, was phoning me going, hey, we need to do the numbers because we were having a meeting yesterday about the numbers. So it's a work in progress in terms of where we're going. Um, um, Scott, just, just sorry, just there's just one, one uh, uh, question I just saw from Caroline, um, just questioning on, on, on overvalues and um, the, what is the value of a property? So Caroline, my belief is the value of the property is the income it produces. Okay, that's very simple. You know, um, if it doesn't produce an income, what's it worth? It's worth whatever anybody will pay for it because they fancy that property. Okay, with residential property and the liquidity of residential property, it's worth what the income is in today. But you know what? At some point in time, there'll be someone that wants to buy that property from you for an inflated price. 
You know what I love, Gary? You weren't on an hour and a half ago. And I literally started an hour and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And I showed them all the international markets. And I said, whether you own a house to live in or you own a house to rent, it should be based on the income of what you can get for it. So the nice well, thing is... Well, no, I, 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 Scott, sorry. But Scott, interestingly enough, the people that buy the house to own to live in, it doesn't matter. It's, it's your home. As long as you're happy there and you can afford it, it doesn't matter. And that's why people pay. So if I've got a really nice home, Someone will buy that from me at an inflated price because there's a real value to that. At this moment in time, majority of the market is just income based. Yeah, no, brilliant. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to bounce. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I really, really My appreciate it. Pleasure. It's a hell of a lot of I questions. Hope your weather is all better than mine. Is it crack in London? <laughs> there's a there's a hell of a lot of questions that come up. Uh, Shane will be tagging them all, and I'll be answering them in the VIP room. Um, but this, I'm sure, will not be the last time Gary and I um, chat. I always joke with people, he literally, him and his partners, pioneered um, furniture packs and rental guarantees and, you know, and everything 25 years later so that international investors could get into the London market. And what I'm really excited about is with him pioneering this buy-to-let space or buy-to-own space using technology now. And, and that's it's going to be a game changer for everyone. So thank you, Gary. And, I'm I, really excited about it. and, and if anybody ever comes to London, feel free to contact me and we'll take you around and show you with pleasure. Awesome. Keep on, Cheers, Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Bye. Yes. Bye. So let's round up for today. And um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's always a challenge when you've got these amazing people. I never want to like say cheers. We we need to we need to move on. Um, but I want to just uh, you know, for me, there were two two asset classes that I wanted to go through, and I can see the chats are coming in, you know, you know, thick and fast. So thank you for all the comments, really, really appreciate them. So most people understand investing in two simple things: it's property. And I specifically chose London property because we're talking about international and global diversification. So I specifically chose Gary from London property. And the second one that people understand is the stock market. Now, this lady, Ann Wilson, is one of the most incredible people that I've met. Um, she, she lives her truth. And what I mean by that, she's currently in, um, in Europe um, on a hike. Okay, like, you know, and I, again, she was going to to Italy and to France and to England. So I'm not going to home sure where she is right now, but she's she's offline. So I actually did an interview with her um, about a week or two ago, especially for you guys, to talk about the stock market. And if you've ever, if you haven't heard from Ann Wilson, she's one of the most incredible people I've ever met when it comes to money, to investing, and specifically how to get into the stock market. And so because of time and because people have, um, you know, said to me, you know, they don't want me to run over. And they want me to go to the VIP room and be able to answer questions. What we're going to do is we're actually going to make available um, Anne's video. So you can literally go here, um, diversificationchallenge.com forward slash ETF. And it's going to be live. Now, you know, it's interesting because just like Gary, I asked her to talk, you know, for like 20 minutes. And she had so much value to add that I think it's like 50 minutes long. And so I'm not going to play it now um, in terms of, you know, people. I, I you know, I, I just recommend you go and watch it. And then we can talk about it again tomorrow if the VIPs, you know, come into the VIP room now. And then, you know, tomorrow, if you've got any questions about Anne's stuff, I'm happy to help. The best news is if you go to the resources as well, Anne will also share with you how you can get more information. I love Anne. I highly recommend you follow her knowledge and her stuff is incredible. And when it comes to the stock market, I haven't met someone that truly simplifies and makes investing in the stock market easy, safe, and simple. So I can see there's lots of people saying Anne's brilliant. She changes lives. She's awesome. Completely agree. Love Anne to bits. Um, and by the way, I love her energy as well. Like she teaches something that most people find boring, but she makes it super interesting. So highly, highly, highly recommend that you that you go and watch um, this video in terms of this, this ETF um, um, thing. So I'm going to wrap up for today and then I'm going to jump into the VIP room. So just to remind you, I've got no doubt that your brain is like going, oh my word, like so much information, London ETFs. You know, all the 15 asset classes, primary versus secondary markets. But just remind you, I'm going to keep saying this to you. Remember that we're going through a very conscious process here to, to, to show you because you're going from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent. And you're going like, oh my word, like, you know, I don't know all this stuff. And what we're doing is we're taking you on this journey so that you can literally go to co consciously competent and then finally, ultimately, unconsciously competent. And someone asked a question earlier, you know, when is it too late to, to start? You know, I don't think it's ever too late. You know, like you can, you can, I used the analogy yesterday of an age when we were in the VIP room and, you know, people say, oh, I wish I'd started when I was, you know, 20 and then like they're 50 years old. And it's like, well, someone who's 90 goes, well, I wish I'd started when I was 50. 
you know, it's just one of those things where it's never too late uh, to get started in terms of that process, um, in terms of where we're at. So the action steps for today, reminding you that silver is compulsory, my strong recommendation, and gold is the bonus. So under silver, what I'd like you to do is to go and fill in your top five countries. So in your opinion, what are your top five countries that you would like to invest in? Go and fill in your top five currencies. Is it the pound? Is it the euro? Is it the dollar? Is it the rand? Is it the, you know, Chinese yuan? You know, whatever. Indian rupee, whatever. Fill in your top 15 assets. What are the top 15 assets that you would like to invest in? And by the way, again, you can you can do it all your, you know, yourself. Or if you're interested and you want to go deeper and you want to learn and have the knowledge, you can do it through partnership. You, you know, I've, I've, I've literally, will share with you over the next couple of days, how I literally, with the team, take people on this journey. And through partnership, you, you don't have to figure it out and do it all yourself in terms of that process. And then again, please share one key takeaway in terms of diversification. Now, there's one extra bit of the homework that I would highly, highly, highly recommend. And that's that you watch uh, Ann Wilson's um, um, video tonight. Um, she talks about the psychology of money. She talks about investing. She's incredible, incredible, incredible. So I'd highly recommend putting some time aside tonight and watching that um, <clears throat> because it, it really will add value. And you'll come tomorrow with a good understanding of, I mean, we've been through all the asset classes at a high level today, but we've gone into property at a deep level. And Wilson goes into ETFs and the stock market at a deep level. And then tomorrow we're going to go into asset allocation, which is, again, Anthony is, um, he works for Calio and they manage 60 of the wealthiest families in the world's money. And he's going to be talking about asset allocation and the six fundamental principles that you need to follow. Now, can we agree if we look at this, like you can figure this stuff out all yourself. You can go and learn all this stuff yourself, or we can literally come and copy what 60 of the wealthiest families are doing in the world. Yes or no? It's just me. Am I the only one who's excited? Um, and then the gold is, I actually went and found a risk uh, tolerance assessment. Um, I went and did it myself. And there's a little link here um, where you can do your own risk tolerance. So we all come from different uh, risk backgrounds. And, you know, some of us take more risk, some of us take less risk. There's lots of them out there. There's lots of free ones. But, you know, it's always interesting to know what your risk tolerance is. So, I um, went and looked at a few of them. I specifically wanted to find a free one. I think with time, Shane, we need to create our own one, but we don't have one at the moment. So, um, so what I um, what I what I've done now is I've just put that in as a link, and I can see that Shane's put that in, and we'll we'll have that in the resources as well, in terms of um, what is happening. So, just to remind you, I'm now going to jump into the Q and A. Shane very kindly takes all the questions that have come through here, and even if they're not um, in the VIP, we still answer them going into the VIP now. Uh, to all the VIPs, you should have the link. Um, it's the same as yesterday. We'll jump into that and we'll answer questions. I know yesterday we spent the best part of an hour. Just to remind you, there's still time to join the VIPs. You know, you're going to get um, all of the all of the coaching from my side and, and me giving, you know, the perspectives. I can answer all the stuff that Gary spoke about because sometimes speaking the world of investment, people don't understand it or the language of investment. You'll have all the replays because we're recording everything. So you've got that. You've got lifetime access to all the trainings. And then also, you've got literally the module one of countries. So, you know, I'm going to talk more about this uh, over the next couple of days. But you're literally getting everything for $47, uh, which is kind of a bit of a no-brainer um, in terms of that process. So that's the VIP upgrade. Reminding you of the group, if you want to join, um, I highly recommend the WhatsApp group and the Facebook group so we can share it. And I'd like to, just as the final comment, you know, what did you think of today's session? Um, was it good? Was it overwhelming? Was it a lot of information? I remind you that, you know, this is the formula. And so, you know, I'm trying to share with you this golden formula. And so what we've done today is we've we've done countries, we've done currencies, and we've done assets at a high level. Now, you know, when you do wealth going global and you go deeper, we, we, we spend, you know, more time going into countries, currencies, assets. We go into residential, we go into commercial. We go into other alternative assets. And what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to have Anthony come along and he's going to now talk about portfolio construction. How do you actually look at all the different assets? There was a good question about bonds as an example and what impact they play, et cetera. And then, you know, day four, we go to partners and day five, we go to time and you start to see how it all comes together with regards to the passive income and the golden formula. 
So to remind you, if you felt overwhelmed today and, and you, you're thinking, geez, like Scott, thing, I mean, there's so much information. I don't know what to do next. We will talk about it over the next couple of days. We've literally got this home study course, Wealth Going Global, where we teach you and I'll show you live how to do it. But we have an online program where you can literally go and do your top five countries, do your top five currencies, choose your top 15 assets, understand how to get your partners, build a wealth plan over time and ultimately use technology in terms of this process. And um, finally, you know, I always try and close off with, with what is simple for people, reminding you that ultimately it comes down to the right information, the right partners. You can sit on stage, you can come along, you can learn from people, but the difference between someone like Gary and Anne is they're doing it. And so you're literally learning from people that are doing it. They're giving you the right information, they're giving you access. We are trying to give you access to the right partners in terms of this process. And then really the plan for day three, it's now how to build a diversified portfolio. And so in conclusion, Nelson Mandela said, money won't create success, the freedom to make it will. Thanks for an incredible session. I'm sorry it uh, went over a bit, but it's always hard to, uh, to cap someone like Gary, who's got incredible insights and knowledge. And to those of you who are in the VIP, I look sure forward to seeing you there. And before we go there, the prize winner, Shane, who is our prize winner for today? Um, who who's uh, getting the prize for the VIP experience today? Well, Scott, I was thinking this. There's, there's been so many comments, so many, so much feedback. Uh, what I was thinking is, um, why didn't we put uh, that feedback into the Facebook group, and then we'll pick a prize winner for tomorrow? Um, so go to the Facebook group, post your feedback from today, and then we'll pick a prize winner from there. Awesome, brilliant. Okay, Shane. Excellent. So uh, we'll pick a prize winner tomorrow based on everyone's feedback in the Facebook group. So thanks for that, Shane. I Because by the way, I can't even keep up and it's brilliant, brilliant to see all of this. Uh, Shane, please make sure you you save them all because I'm going to jump now to the to the Zoom room um, for the VIPs and I obviously want to be able to, to get it. Um, Grace or anyone else, if you've um, paid to be part of the VIP um, process, you will you should have the link or reach out to Shane uh, directly and he'll be able to assist you. So time for the Q&A, time to be able to go and answer um, any questions you've got. I love, I love London property. Funny enough, I am um, uh, the big developer, that uh, the big construction company that um, that Gary was talking about is a company called O'Shea's. I worked for them for five years, a big Irish construction company in London. I lived there for nine years. I started investing in London at the age of 24. I've got a deep, deep understanding of the London market and I look forward to talking it through with you. But for today, thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow and hopefully you can see that we're just going each day to the next level and really trying to provide as much value as we possibly can. See you tomorrow.